welcome to Censored, a podcast about the oldest topic of all, sex. Specifically, sex in books. I'm Aoife Vrithnach, a historian with a taste for dirty old books. If you do like the podcast, can you share an episode with some friends? Or leave me a review wherever you listen. You can also join me on Patreon for early episodes and research notes. Check out the show notes for links to both Patreon and my merch shop. This episode is part two of my deep dive into the Country Girls trilogy, Edna O'Brien's famous novels about Irish girlhood. If you missed the first part, go to the beginning of season six and check out the Dirty Irish Colleen's episode. I spoke to Dr. Maureen O'Connor about the first book in the trilogy and the stick that O'Brien received as a result. The Country Girls was published in 1960 and its sequel, The Lonely Girl, in 1962, so she didn't wait long between books. When The Country Girls ended, Kathleen, the heroine, had been disappointed by a man who had broken his promise to take her away to Vienna on a dirty weekend. To be honest, I can't say I was sorry. The man in question had been trying to seduce her since she was 14 years old. He wasn't only married, he was ancient and horribly inappropriate. So I felt sorry for Kathleen for being jilted, but also relieved that she'd had a lucky escape. Book two opens with Kathleen stuck in the same old rut she was in in book one. Two years on, she's living in the same boarding house, still sharing a room with her best friend Baba and has the same dead-end job. As before, she's dreaming of romance. The Lonely Girl is the further adventures of Kathleen with her sidekick Baba in the big city as they search for love, adventure and a free meal. Now as for the drink to go with the book, there are lots of choices. One of the most memorable is when they're too poor to buy a drink each, so they share a perno until Baba charms a few beers out of a young fella. Baba spends a lot of time flirting in the hopes of dinner and a drink. But I think I'm going to choose gin to go with the book because of this charming passage. We didn't like the taste of gin and tonic so much, but we love the look of it. We loved its cool blue complexion as we sprawled on our hard beds, drinking and pretending to be fast. Baba's greatest ambition is to be fast. She encourages Kathleen to act fast later on in the novel. Fast women appear sophisticated, worldly and sexually experienced. Both Baba and Kathleen desperately want to be anything other than the poor country bumpkins that they are. This sentence about gin reveals their guileless youth as much as any of O'Brien's other more memorable lines. I normally ask why was it banned, but in this case, I already know why. The Lonely Girl was banned because The Country Girls was so controversial. All of O'Brien's work in the 1960s was blacklisted by the board. Between 1960 and 66, the censors banned her five published novels. The only reason she wasn't banned after that was that the law was reformed in 1967. Her publishers did try to appeal some of the bans, but they were all dismissed. The censors had it in for O'Brien and they didn't care who knew it. I'm pretty sure they didn't read The Lonely Girl at all before sticking it on the blacklist. But I am going to read it closely, trying to see if O'Brien doubled down on her sins from the first book. Did the censorship make her more or less outrageous? And if the lads had read it, would they still have banned it? To be honest, I think so. On the very first page, Kathleen is reading F. Scott Fitzgerald's Tender is the Night, which was, funnily enough, not banned. She's skipping to the end to see how the plot works out. And this shouldn't offend anyone, really. But what she says next would definitely worry the censors and their ilk. She says, All the nicest men were in books. The strange, complex, romantic men. The ones I admired the most. With this one sentence, Kathleen confirmed all the greatest fears of the pro-censorship lobby. Because for conservatives, pretty much all reading was morally suspect. 
Even in the 50s, when the board banned more books than ever before, there was a high-profile lobbying campaign to get more publications banned. Ireland may have had one of the strictest censorships in the democratic world, but the demands for more censorship were never satisfied because reading gave people notions. There was no such thing as a safe book. The Kathleen's of Ireland, the young women, were especially susceptible to notions. Girls and women were always cast as the victims of bold books because their morality was too fragile to withstand reading. And they were dangerously weak-minded too. Too much reading could lead them astray. Of course, this isn't a uniquely Irish way of thinking. People arguing for censorship in the UK, the US and Australia say exactly the same thing. Everyone wants to save girls from themselves. Now, O'Brien has no problem agreeing that reading gives girls notions, but naturally she doesn't think it's a bad thing. Who could really blame Kathleen for falling for literary fuckboys? We've all done it. And there's also a liberation in living a rich interior life, especially when your material circumstances are so limited. The thing is, poor Kathleen and Baba don't meet a single decent bloke. When they put on their best clothes and go to a hop, they are left partnerless the entire night because girls have to wait to be asked to dance. Dancing with each other for fun is the lowest thing they could do, so they sit it out like lemons. The men they do know are pretty repulsive. One is nicknamed the body, but not because he has a hot bod. It's because he believes that washing harms the skin. So he's filthy fucking dirty and he confesses it. In fact, probably promotes not washing. To add to that, he's also a serious drinker. He gets completely wasted one night. They have to bring him home to their lodging house where he wakes up the next morning and creates a scene. Christ almighty. I mean, who wouldn't want better than that? Kathleen is right not to settle for a fellow when there's no reason to. In a society where marriage was passport to full emancipation as an adult, it's quite radical to not want to settle. She ends up falling for another much older man, Eugene Gaylard, who's English, married and not Catholic. The holy trinity of badness right there. This follows on from Mr. Gentleman, her love object from book one, who was old, married and foreign. Kathleen definitely has a type. When these books were published, Frank O'Connor said of O'Brien that she had poor taste in men, which is a fair criticism of the men in The Lonely Girl. But then, why should a heroine be perfect? Writing a novel from the point of view of a young, foolish-in-love girl is just as valid as any other point of view. O'Brien's work challenged because she wrote girls who made bad choices, often gleefully and with their eyes wide open. These were not two-dimensional, simple country girls adrift in the big city. Kathleen thinks this at one point. There are no innocent girls, I thought. They're all scarlet girls, like Baba, with guile in their eyes. Scarlet girls. Fucking love that. All those seemingly innocent girls are in your heads, lads. Or even worse, those fast girls, from the moral panic rhetoric, really do exist. I believe this was O'Brien's real sin. She took the contradictions of the moral panic and wrote about it. The crazy rhetoric around girls was that they were inherently wanton. Give a girl a bad book to read and she'd be whoring round the town. At the same time, in the same sentence, the conservatives would say that the Irish girl was naturally modest and demure, a veritable paragon of virtue. Baba and Kathleen, you could say they embody the moral panic around girlhood that disfigured the 20th century. They're a touching combination of both wild and innocent. One minute they're almost childish and the next they're cynically batting their eyelashes at random blokes. O'Brien took the rhetorical contradiction at the heart of the moral panic and showed how it was a perversion of humanity by creating these two characters. The binaries of good and bad collapse in the characters of Baba and Kathleen and the reader is utterly charmed by them. Honestly, could O'Brien be more audacious than that? 
Well, I'm happy to report that she was. If we just take the superficial element of the names Kathleen and Baba. Baba is the pet form of Bridget, who was the foremost female saint in the native pantheon. In the 1930s, the cult around St. Bridget was revived to help promote a modest dress campaign, which was part of that moral panic madness I just talked about. I had this light bulb moment when I read a tweet from Dr. Lisa Godson about this. It's just an amazing insight into how cults can be refashioned for contemporary purposes. Bridget was a suitable role model for Irish women because of her deep humility and modesty. Characteristics nobody could embody if they wore a dress from America. O'Brien's Baba is a gleeful subversion of this saintly image because she's a right smart arse. Quick-witted and funny, she uses lots of slang as well. They were always worried about the pollution of slang coming in through American comics and how it would affect people's native outlook on life. She ruthlessly flirts for freebies, exploiting her looks and charm whenever she needs to. Baba's always up for a laugh. She's determined to have fun. No downcast, saintly demeanour for her. But she's not jaded or cynical. She's just smart. Kathleen, on the other hand, you could say she's named after Kathleen Nihulahan, the personification of Mother Ireland, so beloved of the 19th century literary revival. Now, she's not a Shan Van Vocht, a poor old woman, like the literary trope, because O'Brien is much more daring than that. She takes Kathleen Nihulahan, plundered by England, and transforms her into a lonely young woman in love with an Englishman. I mean the balls to do that. It's just brilliant. Funnily enough, Kathleen is as oppressed as the Shan Van Vocht, but not by the English. Her oppressors are her father, and the society as a whole. After she's been seeing Eugene for a while, she receives an anonymous typed letter. It read, Are you aware that this man is evil and has lived with numerous women and then walked out on them? If you cease to disregard this information, I shall have to secure your parents' address and inform them. A friend. Her reaction was, I knew that something drastic was going to happen. I think we need to pause and really consider this creepy bit of vigilanteism. It's not from someone who knows her or her people. The threat to secure her parents' address shows that. The anonymous author doesn't even know Kathleen's mother is dead, that only her father is alive. Yet someone with so little knowledge of Kathleen personally sees fit to tell her what to do. The sense that she is being watched by persons unknown is really chilling. This is communal surveillance, where the moral judgments of strangers matter more than individual choice. It should be nobody's business who Kathleen sees, but that's not the sort of society she lives in. She ignores the letter and the inevitable happens. Her drunken father arrives into her place of work with yet another typed missive. The so-called friend had written a scurrilous note accusing Eugene of doping girls. But it's the first and the last lines that I want to really look at. The first line is, It's high time you knew about your daughter and the company she keeps. The letter writer is practically spitting with rage that Kathleen has a life her father does not know about. How dare she live without reference to him? And the accusation doubles back on him too. The your daughter phrase makes him responsible for her failings. So his reputation is bound up with hers. And then there's the last line. I hope I'm not too late in warning you, as I wouldn't like to see a nice Catholic girl ruined by a dirty foreigner. Well, holy fuck. The arse-licking, sleeveine tone of it. Butter wouldn't melt in the mouth of this particular holy Joe. The way the phrasing lingers on dirty foreigner. Like it savours the taste of the slur. And ruined is a very potent word. Once again, it invokes reputation, but also bodily integrity and cleanliness. Here, Kathleen and her father are about to be ruined by Eugene. But maybe they'll be ruined by informers writing sneaky letters. I think it's not quite clear what the real threat is. 
What Mr. Brady did next, after he confronts Kathleen with this letter, was pretty unexpected. He abducts her. Yes, he actually kidnaps her. She tries to pander to his suggestion that she go home with him, but then she tries to run away, and this happens. And this is quite a long bit for chapter 8, but I think it's really important. I was nearly at the corner of Joanna's Road when I heard the car close behind me. Come back here, my father called. I ran faster, knowing that he was too drunk to catch up with me. But the car drove on a little, passed me by, and then he jumped out just as I turned to run the other way. He caught me by the belt of my coat. I tell you, you won't do this again. I'm not going home, I'm not going home, I screamed, hoping that some passing stranger might rescue me. Get in that car, he said. I held on to a railing. I'll tell the police, I said, and by now the taxi driver had come out of the car and both of them hustled me toward the door, which was swinging open. They pulled me across and I was afraid that my new coat would get torn. Children gathered across the road to look at us and the taxi driver said I ought to have more sense and why would I not go with my father who wanted to save me from the streets? I got as far away from my father as I could and during the ride he abused me and told the taxi driver what an impossible girl I had been and how I had driven my mother to an early grave. Good beating, she wants, he said as I cried to myself. Honestly, I was shocked by this. She's bundled screaming into a cab and no one comes to her assistance. The taxi driver helps drag her into the cab. This is terrifying. Kathleen isn't beaten by her father, but this for me is as violent as a beating. Bear in mind, like her father is roaring drunk at this point. He's a complete mess while she's well dressed and stone cold sober. But somehow he's the one with right on his side. When they get on the train, he meets a crowd of lads he knows well and they also back him up. They connive to stop her escaping, following her to the loo and watching her whenever he doesn't. The men, at a moment's notice from this patriarch, can switch on a complete surveillance system. Kathleen is trapped in her family and everyone agrees that's as it should be. Her independent life outside her father's control can be snuffed out at his whim. It's fucking dark, lads. In her home village, she knows everyone is talking about her by their savage, stare-you-out eyes. I think O'Brien deserves an award for that phrase alone. It's bone-chilling. Anyone who's ever felt the weight of a country stare will feel it. In the next few chapters, Kathleen tries to escape, asking everyone she can for help, but they all say no. No one will go against her father, and everyone thinks she's too young and stupid to make her own choices. Honestly, this section of the book is so tense. I read it really quickly, desperate to find out how it ends. And there's a lot in it, including a meeting with a priest that I could probably do most of an episode on. To skip forward, and I'm skipping lots of juicy stuff, you've got to read it yourself. She legs it and gets back to Eugene's house. As if that wasn't enough drama, her father and his mates show up at Eugene's door to demand her back. At one point, her dad brings a bishop to persuade her. It sounds ludicrous when I say it, but for Kathleen, all of this is deeply traumatic. She is profoundly humiliated. Worse, she's torn between her feelings for Eugene and her obligations to her father. The way Kathleen experiences this crisis is as a choice between two men. It's hard for her to see this drama as about herself. This gives the narrative a melancholy quality. Underneath all the soap opera shenanigans, the poor thing can't even see herself because the men are taking up all the space. And the word ruined pops up again, but its meaning has been flipped. She feels her father has ruined her by his behaviour. That's a pretty remarkable inversion of that powerful word from the informer's letter. Her father is the ruin of her happiness and self-respect, not the seductive foreigner. But finally, on to the sex, because there is actually sex in this book. As you know from the episode on the Country Girls, there was no sex in part one of the trilogy, 
The closest we got to it was when Mr. Gentleman and Kathleen undressed and stared at each other's naked bodies. She found his penis vaguely ridiculous looking. That's more childish show me yours and I'll show you mine than a raunchy sex scene. But there's lots of bedroom action in The Lonely Girl. Unfortunately, most of it ends in no sex because Kathleen is scared shitless. Her fear arises from a deep physical revulsion of messy bodies. As a child, she knew nothing about breastfeeding until Baba explained it and she found it so gross she vomited. Her terror of pregnancy isn't about the social stigma it represents, but the physical reality of it. Bodies embarrass and unnerve Kathleen. She feels ashamed at her fears because she does fancy Eugene Rotten. She loves kissing him. One of the saddest, most wistful lines in the book is, I thought, if only people just kissed, if all love stopped at that. She's such a naive young girl. She's totally out of her depth physically. Kathleen acknowledges that her upbringing is part of the problem. She was taught wives tolerated their husbands in bed for his sake, not for her own pleasure. It's interesting that O'Brien doesn't put the word sin in her character's mouth because Kathleen is not worried about sin. She is wordlessly, deeply revolted by the physical act of love. Even in her sleep, she turns away from Eugene's caresses. After numerous failed attempts, they finally do have sex after he puts a fake ring on her finger. They're pretend married for a bit. I think it's significant that a show of marriage precedes the sex. Kathleen is reassured by his commitment. Unfortunately, me as a reader, I wasn't. When you do read it, you'll probably be saying, no, Kathleen, he's a dick. Don't do it. But she does do it. All of it. And this is the sex scene in chapter 15. Knock, knock, let me in, he said, coaxing his way gently into my body. I am not afraid, I am not afraid, I said. For days he had told me to say this to myself, to persuade myself that I was not afraid. The first thrust pained, but the pain inspired me, and I lay there astonished with myself as I licked his bare shoulder. Isn't that so sad? She has to persuade herself that she's not afraid. It's just heartbreaking that her fear is so powerful. But it goes on. I felt no pleasure, just some strange satisfaction that I had done what I was born to do. My mind dwelt on foolish, incidental things. I thought to myself, so this is it, the secret I dreaded and longed for. All the perfume and sighs and purple brassieres and curling pins in bed and gin and it and necklaces had all been for this. I saw it as something comic and beautiful. The growing excitement of his body enthralled me, like the rhythm of the sea. So did the love words that he whispered to me. Little moans and kisses, kisses and little cries that he put into my body, until at last he expired on me and washed me with his love. Now that is a beautiful paragraph. It's really remarkable. Unfortunately, there is no denying Kathleen's passivity, it seems that Eugene is the one having sex with her rather than she's having sex with him. She isn't really a full-blooded participant in this physical act. There is something profound about Kathleen's ignorance. It's much more than an absence of information. She has no imaginative framework of reference for sex. Kathleen might have read Chekhov and Joyce, but that wasn't enough to broaden her mind Naturally, the Joyce she read wasn't Ulysses, which probably would have given her something to think about. I think her stunted imagination was the desired aim of the censorship system that banned depiction of heterosexual love other than kissing. Kathleen is clueless because girls raised in Ireland were deliberately kept ignorant. As I keep saying, fiction and non-fiction, they were brutally censored for sexual content and reproductive information. Even if you didn't read, the films were cut to exclude all but a cursory kiss. What's interesting is the contrast that O'Brien creates between Kathleen and Baba. Baba never reads. She can be coarse, but she has escaped the censor's imaginative universe. 
She understands her world and her body without reference to the prescribed reading material. And I'd like to say that I'm Team Baba in book two in a way that I wasn't in book one. She's a brat in The Country Girls, but a great laugh in The Lonely Girl. The Babas of Ireland, the sharp, streetwise young women, fared better in a society that kept sex so private it was almost invisible. With two eyes in her head, Baba can work it out, but Kathleen is too dreamy and literary to notice what's going on. I really enjoy how O'Brien writes them in such a way that you like both of them. You could hate them. It would be easy to hate Baba for being a bitch, and sometimes you do want to slap her. On the other hand, Kathleen, she can be a bit of a drip and a bit weepy and pathetic. But you like both of them in different ways at different times. It's very convincing characterization. And I think part of the reason they're so attractive is that the humour in the novel is really something. It's magnificent. There are so many comedic moments, like when Kathleen drops a lit cigarette down her cleavage because she's showing off how sophisticated she is. The girls are collected by men who drive vans that smell of greyhounds. There's a visit to a fortune teller that's screamingly funny. And when their friend, the body, gets drunk one night, he shouts, Up the Republic! Up Noel Brown! Up Castro! Up me! I spat my gin out at that part. There's just loads of slapstick. It must be really hard to write slapstick humour, because it isn't very common in serious literary novels. It's really a remarkable work. You can read it quickly for the laughs, or you can take your time and see the grimness alongside the silliness. All that literary talent is one thing. What about censorship bingo? Was this novel actually rude? If the censors hadn't automatically banned it, would they have been able to identify smutty bits? The first box is breasts. Yes, but not as sexual objects in the way men often write about them. It's more about bras and corsets and the clothing of the breasts, but it's definitely a reference. After all, the Archbishop of Dublin thought lingerie ads were explicit, so even saying the word bra was probably too much. Bestiality. Uh, no way. Sex work. This one is interesting. I would say no, but the censors might have felt that girls flirting for freebies was practically prostitution. But I don't think it's justified. I don't think we can tick that. Racism. Oh yes, there are a few casual racist comments. The landlady, Joanna, makes an anti-Semitic remark and Baba tells Kathleen not to accept a drink from Indian men in turbans because they dope girls. You might be surprised to know that there would be men of colour at dances in the 50s in Dublin, but the universities did attract a cosmopolitan student body. Drugs. Well, yes, doping girls is mentioned more than once. Politics. There's that hilarious, drunken, up-the-republic moment, but I don't think that would be enough of its own. A lot of the interaction between Eugene and Kathleen's father contains ethno-nationalist language. Her father brings up the sort of 750 years of oppression, or how many it's supposed to be in 1950. So I think there is that tension there between Eugene as an Englishman and what he represents in Irish political history. So I think we can take it for that. Swearing. No, the dialogue is often in idiomatic Hiberno-English, but there is none of the swearing that's often found alongside that. Infidelity. Yes, Eugene is married and Baba is also seeing a married man. So I can take that one. Crime. I don't think so. Eugene is accused of crime because of his relationship with Kathleen, but there isn't actually anything illegal going on. The important point that Baba stresses is that Kathleen is 21 and so she's over the age of majority. At this time, 21 was when you were legally emancipated from your parents. And Kathleen is legally allowed to do what she likes. Next up, abortion. No. Orgies. Well, I mean, if the main character can't even have sex with one person, she'd hardly manage multiple partners. So no. Definitely not. Then sexual assault. I would say no. 
Now, similar to book one, there are inappropriate older men soliciting kisses, but Kathleen doesn't feel this is abusive, and crucially, she's no longer a child. Extramarital pregnancy. Well, yes, it is a risk of the sex that Kathleen is having and is acknowledged as so. Then masturbation. No way. Sex toys? Uh, definitely not. Feminism. And not as an explicit political stance. Kathleen tells her father she's her own boss, but I don't think she really feels that. So there's no happy feminist ending where the woman realises her own agency matters more than what men think of her. On the other hand, though, isn't it feminist to write about girls making mistakes? To write about girls who are greater than the labels of virgin or whore? I think I will tick it for writing about silly, funny girls who are neither nasty nor nice. Next up, divorce. Yes, Eugene gets divorced. Contraception. If you'll remember that sex scene in chapter 15 when it says, he expired on me and washed me with his love, that could be a literary flourish or the withdrawal method. On the next page, Kathleen says, but you said we wouldn't have any babies. So I think it's probably the withdrawal method. Eugene should hopefully know what he's doing more than Kathleen at this point. Menstruation. Uh, no. God knows how Kathleen coped with that every month. She must have been losing her life. Next up, blasphemy. Actually, her local priest accuses Kathleen of heresy, so I can tick this. Oral sex. Uh, no. Graphic violence. Well, there are some fairly dramatic fighting scenes. They're not very graphic, but I still think I could take it for this one. They're quite significant and traumatic. You'll just have to read the book yourself to find out whether I'm overselling it on the graphic side of things. And finally, queer content. Well, yes, very briefly, there's a coded reference to lesbians. Baba has taken up fencing. The classes are apparently full of women in tight trousers who keep asking her back to their place for tea. So, adding it up, the lonely girl gets a score of 13 out of 25. Thank you, Edna O'Brien, that is properly rude. Book one only got nine, so she was getting dirtier. As Dr. Maureen O'Connor said in the episode on The Country Girls, the trilogy does get darker and the subject matter more adult. It makes sense that book two would get a higher score in censorship bingo because the girls are older now and dealing with bigger shit. I think book two is funnier as well, but there's no bingo score for that, unfortunately. And yes, I do think you should all read The Lonely Girl. If you're interested in Ireland's Magdalene asylums and mother and baby homes, O'Brien's vision of the patriarchal family will make you think. But if you're just looking for a good read, go for it you won't be disappointed. For the next episode, part of my research will be to go to the cinema to see the latest Bond film. I'll be mentally comparing Ian Fleming's spy novel, Diamonds Are Forever, to the newest, most exploding-y film in the franchise. I'm pretty sure there's more sex and boobs in the films than in the original novels, but maybe I'm wrong. Till then... Keep your hands clean and your minds filthy.